just about to start. <laughs> Thank you for coming in the sunshine. And it, uh, we couldn't all fit in a tent anyway. <laughs> so it's just terrific. There are way more people here than, than I, I really expected. And I'm very, very glad you've come. My name is uh, uh, Peter Garrett. And I'm the lucky owner of this house and house and garden here. Yes, and uh, Paul just mentioned that I'm also the architect and builder of this house for that over here. And just because we're, we're dealing with uh, um, um, perhaps climate issues to begin with, you might like to know what this funny bean wall is growing up uh, over the glass. This is a passive solar house and that's the greenhouse uh, at the back of which are bedrooms that are not heated because that heats nicely in the winter. However, in uh, late August and, uh, and, and September, it gets too hot in there. So I grow beans up the wall to stop the heat. And if you ever go in, inside the house, you'll see it, it makes the room uh, just very comfortable looking out through the, through the, bean, the beans for the garden. So, um, <clears throat> But this is, uh, this is the fifth annual garden party that we've ever had here, and they seem to get bigger every year, I suppose, because they're kind of fun. And uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, this is uh, this began by being a, a, um, an event particularly for, for citizens' climate lobby. How many of you are act active members of citizens' climate lobby? Yeah. So half of you okay. <laughs> Citizens Climate Lobby is, is a group of people just like you who actually meet with members of Congress and talk to them about climate solutions and, uh, and, and advise them and also uh, express gratitude for anything they do. One of the things that we've been hoping that they would do is put a price on carbon fuel, on carbon emissions. Obviously, they haven't yet done that, but we keep talking about that, and we keep talking about other climate solutions, one of which is energy efficiency. And energy efficiency, as probably all of you know, comes um, a, lot of, a, bit, a, a lot of it comes with going electric, which is what we're going to hear about today because we have one of the, the prime, maybe the prime expert in going electric, which is Rich Silkman, standing right here, who's the author of this book published in 2019. And uh, I'm going to hand it over now to David Kuhnhart, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the, the Okay. Good day, everybody. Uh, all of you know that for about eight years, uh, Peter Garrett was the head of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby Maine. Well, the present <coughs> head of Citizens Climate Lobby Maine, to show how smart he is, Peter Dugas, is uh, missing this party because he wants to be on the upper parts of the presidential range. Well, I listened to the news forecast this morning, which if, you, if you're familiar with northern uh, New Hampshire uh, weather forecasts, uh, the, the day is rated in, in cents. A pretty good day is 25 cents, right? A really, really good day is 50 centa. This morning it was a 40 centa because 40 degrees, average temperature, 40 mile per hour winds, sub-zero wind chill factor in the upper portions of the mountains where Peter Dugas is climbing. So remember to give him a statement of, uh, uh, of sympathy uh, when he gets back. Uh, there, Richard Silkman is the right man at the right time in the right place. And I want to express that I've, I have read his wonderful book, which he now has a couple more copies here, uh, which in 2019 laid out how to get to net zero, how to get to a zero carbon economy by 2050. And he points out that there are many different avenues, there are lots of different things. 
but the, one of the key things is that Rich has always said we can do this without making it more painful and more comp and more costly for us meter owners and us customers, right? And at the same time, cleaner and cleaner skies. And he has page sixty-three, always been a supporter of a carbon tax, right? <laughs> but one of the one of the problems is that in twenty nineteen. He did not foresee the pandemic. He did not foresee the invasion, the unfair invasion of Ukraine and other things that have gone topsy-turvy. But I think he also understated some of the positive tipping points. Would you, would you agree with some of the uh, positive tipping points that have happened? Now, I just want to tell a couple of little tiny uh, personal stories to connect why I am so glad that he agreed to come here today. One is that many of you know that uh, for 13 years I worked in solar in California and two years ago my wife and I relocated to Scarborough, Maine. Same place as, as Rich and Laura. Now, unfortunately, he lives in right down near the water in a place called Pine Point, which if you know it well, has the reputation of being a small drinking village with a fishing problem. <laughs> I live closer to Cape Elizabeth, but as soon as one of my best friends, Leslie Alden from Northern California, heard that I was moving to Scarborough, Maine, she, who had been the senior staff person for the legislative leader, uh, the late Charles McGlashan, who effectively created community choice aggregation. How many people know that phrase, community choice aggregation? That is when communities can vote under state law to say we want to control our own, almost like rural electric co-op, control our own generation and make it greener and less expensive. Well, in Marin County, California, where I live, we had the first one, and she was the staff person who did more than anybody to help create it in 2009. I ended up being a board member of that, and she said, you're moving to Scarborough. Well, you need to meet Ann and Sandy Butterfield because they're trying to do, they were trying to do the same thing in Boulder, Colorado. And now they're trying to do the same thing in a different way with Pine Tree Power in Maine. So I went over to Ann and Sandy, so they're wonderful, wonderful people. And he happens to be an international standard center on wind turbines, particularly floating wind turbines. And uh, Ann, a big advocate for Pine Tree Power, and we were having, and they, they brought me together in this setting, and they said, and now, we're going to have our economist expert, by the way, PhD economist from Yale, okay? It's, it's all right, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Public sector, private sector, 23 years ago decided to start his own company which would save people money and get them to go more green at the same time, and it has. And, we, and they said, now introducing the expert, the economist who's going to prove that pine tree power can work. Richard Silkman, and he came forward and he gave his address, and then they said, okay, now we want fundraising uh, per, uh, commitments, and two of us raised our hands, and then the automatic sprinkler system came on, and everybody <laughs> had to bail and run away. Uh, but <laughs> about six months after that, Peter Dugas said, you know, we have a corporate leader who has advised governors and so forth in the state, advised dozens of companies how to save money and go green. Uh, we should have lunch with Richard Silkman. And I said, great idea. We went to the Good Table restaurant in Cape Elizabeth. Great lunch, really wonderful conversation. He was, for the most part, agreeable. <laughs> and, <laughs> and six months after that, I'm volunteering for Piper Shores Life Care Retirement Community and trying to help them go solar, these guys, CES, Competitive Energy Solutions, was advising Piper Shores on how to, uh, how to save money on the acquisition of energy. And they did come up with, after some urging, they came up with an opportunity for Piper Shores to latch on to a, uh, uh, a net energy billing uh, allocation that the city of town of Wells had taken, but they took on too much, so they had some extra to go. So 11% of a Rumfield solar farm now is possessed by uh, by Piper Shores, which makes me very happy as as a leader of the 
Buildings and Grounds Committee, and <laughs> we're going to be saving fifty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars a year by being solar customer linked to the program that he brought. So very specific, very real. This ain't no BS. He's the right man at the right time, and I'm so glad that you're here to talk to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David. Can everybody hear me? I'll try to keep my voice turning sideways and moving around, so hopefully people will be able to hear me. <clears throat> it's an old crowd, which means half of you are deaf anyway. <laughs> but we'll, <clears throat> we'll do the best we can. Um, <laughs> David is correct. Um, I am a supporter of carbon taxes, but you cannot be a Yale PhD economist and not support carbon taxes. It's one of the oaths you take before they give you a degree. So it's, um, it's something that really does make an awful lot of sense. It's an extraordinarily hard thing to do um, to get it done, but progress seems to be coming along and interestingly even though we haven't been able to get the actual carbon tax in place <clears throat> we've done a number of other policies that have some of the same effect for instance the northeastern states have something called the regional greenhouse gas initiative or reggie and reggie ultimately is a carbon tax it's not as well designed as one that <clears throat> you know was structured to deal with carbon directly, but it is having some effect on the grid in New England. And there are other places in the country where similar policies and similar things are being undertaken. <clears throat> Energy is a passion of mine. I've been, I've been doing this now for 35 years. <clears throat> My wife Lynn is here with me today. She's heard all of this, and so if you see her nodding off, it's not because she's board it's because she's heard it all before and, and uh, is very supportive and likes to come around and to attend these things with me <clears throat> what I want to do is start out with something that competitive energy services looked at about a decade and a half ago when there was discussion about bringing a new LNG liquefied natural gas facility to Harpswell and the Copscook Bay region. Most, many of you remember that. And we said, what is it about LNG which is so attractive? And I want to give you just a few statistics that demonstrate how difficult ultimately it is to move away from fossil fuel. <clears throat> we figured out, looking at all of the energy that's used in Maine, that we use on average over the course of a year. This is heating, transportation, industrial, wood burning, everything. We use the equivalent of 64 million horsepower years. So in order to use horses to meet all of our energy needs, we would need 64, 000, uh, 64 million horsepower, um, horses. Just that's what horsepower is, one horse, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> in order to have 64 million horses in Maine, we would need about 128 million acres of fields to feed them. <laughs> that is the geographic area <clears throat> from Maine to Baltimore to Cleveland, Ohio. <clears throat> <clears throat> so moving, no, I'm, I'm going to just a little yelling, Sam. Right? So moving, moving you know, away from horses, like we had as our major source of energy three centuries ago, <clears throat> meant that we were able to move away from something that was a very inefficient way of converting the sun to energy, right? Sun grows plants, horses eat the plants, horses give us energy. But extraordinarily inefficient. We then said, well, what about another energy source? Hydropower. Right? That was the next thing in line. In order to meet 100% of our needs in Maine only, we would have to dam and control every single vertical foot of every river in New England. 
that is there would be not a single foot <clears throat> of free flowing water in New England. That is, you have to take advantage of all the water and the height of the land, and we'd have to capture every single vertical foot. Now, <clears throat> we can't do that. <clears throat> so hydropower, oh, thank you. Hydropower is a possibility. We use it a lot, but to meet our energy needs in Maine alone with hydropower is impossible. But we said, what about wind? Now, this was 2008, 2009. We weren't looking at offshore wind at the time. We were looking at onshore wind, and the wind turbines were smaller. But in order to meet our entire energy needs, we would have to have enough turbines to stretch the entire length of the Appalachian Trail. About 1,800 miles worth of turbines in order to meet our needs in Maine. We said then, we looked about solar. We said, well, in order to do solar and meet our 100% of our needs, <clears throat> we would have to cover over a land equivalent of Androscoggin and about half of Saginaw County. Now, Androscoggin, that may be a good idea, but <laughs> Saginaw, we don't want to do, right? No, we don't want to do Saginaw. So, <clears throat> you know, so again, what we're looking at is natural forms of energy. And what you come to realize very quickly is that they are not very dense, right? They're very sparse in terms of the amount of land or the amount of area that you need because the, the energy sources are not dense. We could meet 100% of our energy needs in Maine with seven nuclear plants the size of Seabrook. Now, Seabrook's a big plant, but its footprint is very small. Interestingly, we could meet 100% of our energy needs in Maine with one LNG import facility the size of Canaport up in New Brunswick. Okay. LNG is liquefied natural gas. Thank you. <clears throat> and what that illustrates is just how useful fossil fuels are. Right? They are remarkably dense. And because they're dense, <clears throat> we can use much less of what we value, land <clears throat> and other things, in order to capture the energy benefit from them. So moving away from fossil fuels to other forms of energy means we have to move towards something that is much less dense. And we have to end up devoting much more of our physical landscape to our energy requirements. And not unlike <clears throat> what we used to do 300 years ago, right, when we raised horses. Now, it doesn't have to be that bad, but the numbers are still quite significant. <clears throat> Move ahead now another 15 years to about, you know, 2018, and there was a lot of talk in Maine about moving us to zero carbon. And the general argument against it was that if we try to move to zero carbon, it's going to cost us too much money. Right? We all know that we use a lot of energy per capita in Maine. First, it's cold, and we have to heat our homes. Secondly, we all live out on the boondocks, like here, and we have to drive to stores, and we have to put on more miles for our, you know, to our cars. So on a per capita basis, we use more energy than people do in New York City or in Boston. It's just a function of our geography and of our climate. And people said, well, if we try to move towards a carbon free, we're going to be imposing an energy tax, a big problem for cost for folks in Maine. And intuitively, that is the, the initial response to that is, of course, that's true. Right. I mean, that's just it makes intuitive sense when people say that and people were starting to believe it. <clears throat> Now, those of us in the energy business knew that the numbers weren't exactly correct. That is, if we actually got in and looked at it more carefully, what we could find is that maybe it would cost a lot, maybe it wouldn't, but let's do some analysis to try to figure that out. <clears throat> and that's what I said about trying to do. So I said two things. In order to move to zero carbon, 
in, in, in our society, the first thing we have to do is electrify everything, right? Because we can't burn fossil fuels. So we're not gonna burn oil in our homes. We're not gonna burn oil in our, in our cars. So we have to have electric homes and electric transportation. And ultimately we have to convert Sappy's Mill <clears throat> across the river to an electric, some form of electric or hydrogen derived from electricity, some form of alternative fuel. <clears throat> but it doesn't do us any good to have electric vehicles if we have them plugged into a diesel generator, right? <laughs> it doesn't do us any good to convert <clears throat> to electric space, you know, space heating with heat pumps if the energy that's generating that is from a carbon source. Okay, it could make, make us feel better because we're not burning it in our home, but we're still burning it. And the one thing about carbon is, is it doesn't matter where it comes from. Once it gets in the air, it's the perfect democratic pollutant, right? Everybody feels the effects of it. So <clears throat> the next thing we said was, well, we have to convert our entire grid from one which is fossil fuel based in large measure to one which is 100% renewable. Now, for our purposes, <clears throat> I did not include nuclear, although there's a lot of concern about trying to do this without nuclear, and you read it, but the reality is, is that we're not building nuclear plants in New England for an awful long time. And so I said, we're not gonna focus on nuclear. I also didn't consider any additional hydro because we've already dammed all the rivers in Maine and most of New England anyway, not all of it, but we've dammed quite a bit of it. Uh, and so we're not going to do any more. In fact, the, the movement now is to take things out, not put things in. So I focused on wind and I focused on solar. I said, well, what would it take in order to convert 100% of our generation fleet to wind and solar to power 100% of our energy needs? And then what would that cost? Well, <clears throat> if we convert everything to electricity, the first thing that you realize is we're gonna use a lot more electricity, right? No surprise. And in fact, the amount of electricity that we will end up using relative to today is about three and a half times the amount of electricity. <clears throat> it takes a lot of electricity, even with heat pumps to heat all of our buildings and to power the sappies of the world, right? It takes a lot of electricity. It takes about as much electricity to convert our transportation sector to electricity as our current use of electricity today in Maine. So it's gonna require a lot of electricity. And when we start doing that, we're gonna to have to move that electricity to people's homes. And so we're gonna to have to build out the electric grid significantly. It's not simply plugging in cars to the grid. You can do one, you can do two, but if everybody <clears throat> on Congress Street started plugging their cars into the circuits, we just blow up all the transformers in Maine and Portland. Right? We have to expand the grid considerably. So that's the first thing that we realized that we had to do. The second thing is we had to create a, all that energy and we had to do it in Maine. I didn't want to say, well, let's wave the wand and we'll say we're going to get it from Oregon, right? That doesn't make any sense. Let's do it here. Can we do it here? And the answer is that we can, right? Now, there's a lot of ways of doing it, but there are two things that you, you really need to focus on. The first is not only do you have to create the electricity, but you have to create it when people want to use it. Or you got to store it. Right? It's either or, right? You can't just create the electricity and then, and then with solar and then have it not available to people at night. Right? People like to be able to read by, by light. I mean, you have to have that electricity. So in looking at the array of resource options available, I focused on solar, land-based wind. We still have some availability for land-based wind in Maine offshore wind, and then battery storage. Now, <clears throat> when you look at the load shapes that you have to meet, there are two important considerations in Maine. 
The first is what you can think of as a diurnal load shift. That you have to be able to meet the daily load that people impose on the grid. And that daily load has a real pattern to it. Right? <clears throat> Starting at midnight, it's falling, ramps up at 5, 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, 8, 9, 10, continues up until it gets to about 4, 5 o'clock in the evening, 6 o'clock, and then it starts leveling off and then tapering off as people turn things off and go to bed. So you have to meet that shape. Solar actually works reasonably well for meeting that shape for a good part of the year. It doesn't do anything at night. We have a lot of load at night, but it, it actually isn't a bad load shape for that diurnal load because we use a lot of load when the, when, during the daytime when the sun's out. The second <clears throat> is the seasonal load shape, and that's heat driven. And we have to <clears throat> replace all of that oil and natural gas we're burning in the winter time. And the problem with doing that is that there's not as much sun available. And it turns out that solar is not a very good generating resource to replace the heating load that we all have. But you know what is a good load shape is wind. Turns out that both onshore and offshore, wind is much stronger in the wintertime and the spring and fall seasons than it is in the summer. I mean, we all know this, right? We live here. But it's, you know, it's one of those things that as you start looking at the data, you begin to realize that your experience is actually correct. It's told you something and you can make use of that information. So <clears throat> when we look at the load shapes that we have, and we look at the ability to generate a lot of wind energy to meet that high seasonal winter loads that we have, and we can burn a lot of, or make a lot of solar energy to meet that diurnal and the summer peaks where we're running air conditioning a lot, right, because of the hot weather, and you combine the two, it actually is not an unreasonable generating mix to meet the load shapes that we have. But it's not perfect, right, it never will be. And this is the problem that everybody says, well, it's intermittent, you know. Sometimes the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, right? You heard that all the time. Yeah, of course that's the case. And sometimes, you know, the oil truck doesn't get there, right? I mean, that's all, but we have ways of solving that. The way we solve the problem with the oil truck is we put a tank in our house, right? Well, the way we solve the wind don't blow, sun don't shine problem is we put a battery system. We put a storage system in. Now, it doesn't make sense to put a storage system at everybody's house. It's way too expensive, but it does make a lot of sense to put centralized storage available on the grid that can then be store all that excess sun, sunlight that we have during the day and store some of that excess wind and distribute it out on an hourly basis to match our load. And we can do all of that. We have the technologies to do it. The only question ultimately is what does it cost? And here, the world works in our advantage because we don't have to do this tomorrow. We have to do it over time. And what do we know about these technologies over time is that their costs are falling. So if we start now, we put some in and then we convert a bunch of cars and we put in heat pumps and then we put in some more wind and some solar. We build out the grid a little bit to handle that. We do the next round and the next round. The question is, by 2050, can we have, could we have done that? Can we actually do it? What would it take and what would it cost? Well, <clears throat> in order to do it, what it would take, and, and there are lots of different combinations, but basically what it would take is roughly 7,000 megawatts, the equivalent of seven Seabrooks worth of solar power in, in Maine. <clears throat> that turns out that that's, if you don't put it on rooftops, right, but which we would put a lot on rooftops, but, you know, that's the retail stuff. I mean, we need wholesale stuff. If you don't put it on rooftops, it's about five or six acres per megawatt, 7,000 megawatts. That's about 35, 40,000 acres. Well, Maine has 18 million acres of land. Now, not all of that is good, right? Some of it's on the north slopes. Some of it's in the swamps. But even if you get down to 2 million acres, we only need 45,000. Now, the irony 
is that when you do 45,000 acres of solar and you do it in small batches all over the place, it looks like you're paving Maine with solar. In fact, you're not, right? I mean, you know, we, when we drive around Maine, what do we, you know, what do we think Maine is? Well, it's a, it's a lot of little retail commercial establishments because that's what we see, right? We don't pay attention to the 20 miles between the establishments where there's nothing, right? So <clears throat> the land requirement for this solar is not very significant at all. I mean, 40,000 acres is a lot of land, don't get me wrong, but we lost on average annually over the last 30 years, more than 40,000 acres a year of farmland in Maine to development. You know, it just disappeared. You know, but we, you know, something took its place, but we still have an enormous amount of vacant land in Maine. So we can do that. It would take about 3,000, give or take, megawatts of onshore wind. Now, the one up in, that they're proposing up in Aroostook, that's 1,000 megawatts. So we would need, and we have a, almost 1,000 megawatts currently in Maine. Now, you wouldn't know it. You don't see it unless you're up in the mountains where you're over here at Freedom. You, know, you can see that, that facility, which, by the way, we developed. I'm just, in, you know, that was our facility. But <clears throat> if you look across, you know, Maine, we can put in, in the county, we can put in, not on our ridge tops because it's very expensive to put it on our ridge tops. It's way more expensive to plant turbines in fields than it is to put them on ridge tops. And so we can do this in Maine and, and, and get that kind of generation available to us. But what's most important is 5,000 megawatts of offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. Without that offshore wind, there is no way that we can meet our energy needs in Maine with renewable generation in Maine. It just won't happen. There's not enough resources available to us at a cost that we can afford. We could put in a lot more solar, but every one of those solar units now has to be accompanied by a battery because we need that power at a different time. And when we start talking about batteries, we start talking about expense. They're the most expensive of all of the technologies that I've just gone through. So we want to economize on those because they're expensive and we can do that with the offshore wind. Well, when we <clears throat> develop all of that right, resource over the next 30 years, that would cost us roughly 50, 60 billion with a B dollars. It's a lot of money. In addition to that, we have to build out the electric grid, as I mentioned. Right, those wind turbines in Aroostook don't do us any good in Portland unless we can bring that power down to Portland. The offshore wind doesn't do us any good in Rumford unless we can bring that offshore wind to Rumford. <clears throat> so we're going to need a lot of transmission lines to be developed. Remember, we're moving three times the amount of energy. Now, we don't necessarily need exactly three times the amount of capacity because it varies by time and so on. But it's like a road. You can't move three times the number of cars on a road without getting huge amounts of congestion. The problem is that electricity grids don't like congestion. Right? The second you have congestion, the grid collapses and everything goes black. So power has to flow. And so you need to be able to provide those patterns to do it. That's another five to ten billion dollars over the next 30 years. So we're roughly on the order of 60. 65 billion dollars in order to do this. Okay. Now, again, that's a lot of money. Over 30 years, that's a little over two billion dollars a year of investments that we have to make in order to make this transition happen. <clears throat> you raise numbers like that and people get scared. Two billion dollars, and we can barely get bonds passed for a hundred million dollars for turnpikes or the university or public housing or whatever it is we're trying to do. But people worry about that. And here's what they forget: that when you do this, you never have to go to a gasoline pump again. That you don't have to pay the oil dealer for the energy that's being delivered to your house. You, don't, you can disconnect the gas line. 
No more propane trucks, although there'll be a person or two that likes cooking with gas and they'll have a propane truck, right? But no more propane trucks coming to your house that you have to pay for. Today, on fossil fuels, we devote roughly, it's a ballpark number, 10% of our income across the state to energy. That's all fossil fuels now, a little bit of wood here and there, but it's all fossil fuels. Our gross state product is about $60 billion. 10% of that is, you can do the math, right? $600 million a year that we're paying on energy. Six, I'm sorry, $6 billion a year, thank you, yeah. That we're paying, you can do the math, I can't. That we're, that we're paying for energy every year, $6 which, billion. Dollars. Which is going out of state. For the going out of state. <clears throat> If you take that six billion, it turns out that not surprisingly, because the numbers are, I mean, there's a, there's a logic to all of this internally, that that is roughly the annual payment to retire $60 billion worth of debt, right? So we're just paying it differently. And right? instead of paying it in nickels and dimes and dollars and tens every time we fill up, we're paying it in the form of higher electric rates. Right? They will, we will pay more for our electricity, but that's fair. We're not paying for gas or oil any longer. It is, but it's not quite as nice as people would like us to believe. And, and the reason is, is because when we, buy the, when, we, when we buy the oil and gas, we know where that's Going. It's going to the producers. Now it turns out that a lot of that is in the United States these days because we're fracking and we have a lot of energy in, in the US. But, but a lot of it is being exported overseas. <clears throat> but when we do this conversion, we're now buying wind turbines and we're buying solar facilities and we're buying batteries. Now not much of that's going to get made in Maine. Right? We have to be realistic about this. Some might, and there'll be components that will be but we're still going to export a lot of those dollars anyway out of Maine. But we're trying to make sure, and Biden is trying the best he can, to make sure that a lot of that productive capacity is in the U.S. But we also, when we do that, we also, when we do this conversions, there's a lot of civil engineering work. Right? I mean, <clears throat> when we put the wind turbines up <clears throat> in uh, Freedom, those wind turbines, about half the cost of, developing, of putting those wind turbines up was civil engineering work that was in Maine. Half the cost with the turbines, we bought them from GE. They sourced their product, God knows where, around the world. <clears throat> so half of that was exported, but half of it stayed local. And that's probably the relative balance when you look across all of the component parts in all of what we're going to do. Now, <clears throat> we can do this transition, and we can do it this way, but only if we do it smart. Right? We can't do stupid things. We can't pay too much for solar. We can't pay too much for wind. Right? We can't pay too much for batteries. And what that means is that we want to follow the cost curve of all of those technologies down. Right? We have to contribute a little bit to make sure that cost curve falls. Right? Solar has fallen 92% in the last 20 years in terms of installed cost. Now, it wouldn't have done that if Germany hadn't subsidized solar, if the US hadn't subsidized solar, and if the you know, people in, in had made the, the conscious decision to pay a little bit more for solar than for other power initially. But the value of that <clears throat> is up, available to all of us today when we can put solar on and have it be less costly than the energy that we would get off the grid. So we have to follow those cost curves down. <clears throat> the onshore wind cost curve it continues to fall, but the big two that we have to take full advantage of is offshore wind and batteries. Those are the two. <clears throat> and so we don't want to do everything right away. You know, we don't, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't want to commit to putting in megawatts worth of batteries today. That doesn't make any sense. What we want to do is put in a lot of solar today, big solar fields. That does make sense. That's good economics. And 
10 years from now, when we start saturating the grid with all that solar, and we have to find a place to put it, battery costs are gonna be 30, 40% in real terms, lower than they are today, <clears throat> and we can afford the batteries. And so that's the transition that we have to make. Now, what's interesting is it makes this transition harder is that what's happening to fossil fuels as we do this? The price of fossil fuels, if we're successful, is going to go down. It's not going up, right? I mean, we have less and less. The amount of, <clears throat> the amount of gasoline that we use in our cars, just passenger cars, not trucks, and our cars every year in the United States is equal to the annual production of Saudi Arabia. Now, imagine what would happen tomorrow to the price of oil in the world markets if we took the amount of demand equal to Saudi Arabia off the market. Well, what happened is that the cost would start to fall. Right? And as the costs fall, what occurs is that that gas guzzler you have isn't so bad anymore. And maybe I'll keep it a little longer. And so we have to be worried about this effect. Now, it's not happening yet, but we don't have a lot of renewable Carbon generation tax. yet. Carbon Carbon exactly. <laughs> these, these guys have heard this before. But that's the, that's the completes the circle. And then we, again, we don't have to do it right now, but we got to move to the point where <clears throat> as those carbon prices or the fossil fuel prices rather are falling, we offset the fall in those prices by carbon taxes. <clears throat> well, either way, right? <clears throat> we call a spade a spade, right? It's, it's carbon taxes, they're taxes. So we, put, we, impose the, <clears throat> we impose the cost on the carbon and we dividend it back to people in the form of income. And that completes the circle and allows us to move more aggressively along this pattern where it's in everybody's best interest to do so. There's an eager question over to your right. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, the, the comment related, uh, the gentleman lives in South Carolina for nine months of the year. Boo. <laughs> but he does, live in, he does live in South Carolina for nine months of the year, right? And, and he has solar in his house, and the utility company charges him a flat fee of $30 a month to cover the cost of providing wires and service to him. He also owns a Prius. I assume it's a plug-in Prius, and he has to pay an extra no, it's not, fee. It's not a it's not plug-in? Hi oh, hybrid. All right, so he has, he has to pay an extra amount of money for his Prius for pay for the roads. <clears throat> it hurts, but we got to do that, right? I and mean, we can't have a gas tax with everybody having electric vehicles. We're going to be driving on roads that are full of potholes, that our bridges are collapsing. We have to figure out a way to transition to a per miles basis fee or something like that. And it has to be done in a reasonable way. And people are making those transitions now. In addition, we can't have people doing net metering and not paying for anything for the utility. Right? There's a wire there that comes to your house. You need the wire unless you want to live off the grid. God bless you, right? if you want to live off the grid. But if you want to live on the grid and connect to the electric grid, you got to pay for it. And so we have to figure out a way to let people put solar on their roofs, but pay the, a fair amount, a reasonable amount, to maintain connection to the electric grid. Now, I don't know whether $30 or 25 is the right number. It's 30 extra. Oh, 30 extra. All right. But, you know, we, we, we have to cover these costs, and we can't be silly about it. And, and in, unless we're willing to accept this kind of a transition, we're going to run into all of these problems. And they exist all over the place, right? This is one manifestation of it. I don't want to pay to connect to the grid because I'm generating my own electricity. No, you got to pay to connect to the grid. And I don't want this transmission line to go down through the state. No, you got to have transmission lines in Maine. But we have to develop these. Now, there are better places to put them. I understand that. And sometimes they can go underground. 
But just to give you one example, in Portland, Maine, right, right now Portland, Maine uses, and the numbers won't necessarily mean much to you, but I'm going to use them because you can get the order of magnitude, uses about, in Portland, I'm thinking of Portland from Freeport to Scarborough to Gorham. So that is, a, is an electrical area of CMP. That area uses around 300 megawatts of capacity on its peak day. When we electrify Portland, and we put solar panels on every possible roof that they could be put on in, in Portland, Maine. The, the amount of electricity Portland will consume on peak will go from 300 to around 1,100 megawatts. Now that peak turns out to be a, probably 8 o'clock on a Thursday after, or evening in January when it's minus 8 degrees. Not a single kilowatt hour is being generated from that solar on all of Portland, right? And that's with all 100% of the houses have, have solar. If we put it on 100% of the houses and buildings in Portland, we could meet on an annual basis about 50% of their energy needs. That's every single house. Portland, when you look at that area, is going to need 1,100 megawatts. One, the equivalent of generation of Seabrook nuclear plant to get into Portland to meet Portland's obligations. Well, the only way to do that <clears throat> is with a 345 kV line, the ones coming out of Maine Yankee that you see when you cross by Thompson. You got to have one of those lines coming into Portland. Doesn't exist today because there's not enough load. So it's got to come in. And the thing about transmission lines is they don't come singly. Uh, you can't have one because when it goes down, nobody has power. Right? And because of the reliability requirements we impose on the grid, they can't even come in pairs. Because the way we test the grid is we stress test it. And we do, we do the stress test is we take out the two largest sources of power. And the system has to be stable without those two. So you got to take out the two lines. So that means we need three lines coming into Portland. And those three lines, when they come in, if you put them above ground, the right of way is roughly the size of 295. So we need three of those into that Portland area. I mean, the scale is phenomenal. It's unlike anything we've ever done since we decided to all have cars when we built the roads. Now, we ultimately did it. And we have Portland has a lot of roads, right? not surprisingly. But we're going to have a lot of transmission lines in order to get these things built. Now, now one more thing and then I'll jump over, okay? The other thing about the transition I want to mention, and then I'll stop. I mean, I could go on all day. And, and judging from the looks of you, some could last all day, some not so much. But, <laughs> and the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention is that transition from carbon-based fuels to renewable energy that we've oh. talked about. The cost structure of those are very, very different, right? When, when you, you buy, buy gas, you buy oil, it's an operating cost. You're paying it out of cash, right? It's every day you put in a little bit more money. You put in a little bit more money, a little bit more money. And you, and, but it's coming out of your pocket on a daily basis. And what, we, what we've tried to do over the last century is find the cheapest sources of oil so that we don't have to put as much money onto the table to buy it. Cheapest sources of gas. That's why fracking got developed. It's cheap. When we do renewable, we're investing in capital. And so what we have to do in order to make this transition as cheap as possible is find the cheapest sources of capital. Right, we have to economize on what's expensive and, and what is the primary cost driver, and that's capital. So we have to find cheap sources of capital. And the cheapest source of capital that we have in this country is state and local bonds. Right? And so we have to be able to utilize those. The most, that's not the most expensive source. The most expensive source of capital is stuff the Silicon Valley raises. But the, but the next an expensive source of capital is equity paid to investor-owned utilities. 
And so as we make this transition, we ought to be moving towards what Seth has been pushing and others have been pushing in the legislature, pine tree power, because it has a cheap source of capital. Yes, it will get us savings today, but the current rate base for, the, for CMP today is about three or $4 billion. We're gonna put $10 billion in over the next 30 years on the transmission and distribution side alone to handle this transition. Why pay eight or 9% on that money when we can pay 3%? It really matters. And then the other area is all that generation. Right? Why pay Mitsubishi or anybody else to go out and build those turbines up in Aroostook or put all that solar up in you know, Somerset County or wherever it's going to be? Let's create an authority like the Turnpike Authority, the main generation authority that can underwrite the development of all of this generation. Now, they're not going to build it. Right? They're going to private contractors are going to build it. And private contractors can operate and maintain it. But the financing of this becomes critical. And that's why this pine tree power option, and ultimately, if we can get it through the legislature, the main generation authority, makes a lot of economic sense. It will help us on that glide path to make sure we can afford to do what we're trying to do. So you had a question. The question was net metering. You know, the argument that I made is that it's not providing enough money to cover the cost of serving a house, for instance, that has solar on its roof. What are alternatives to that net metering structure? Wicked important question and a very difficult one, not economically, but emotionally. Right? I mean, you put that solar on your roof and you believe that you're generating all your power and you shouldn't have to pay anybody for anything. And at one level, that's true. The problem is that the energy that comes off that roof is only a small piece of what's necessary to run the electric grid. Right? <clears throat> what's necessary to run that electric grid is capacity. If somebody has to pay for today, has to pay for that natural gas plant that's going to generate electricity when your solar plant's not running, or the battery when your solar plant's not running. So even though, yes, you are putting enough generation on the grid, the timing is wrong. And in electricity, it's all about timing as to when it's being generated. Secondly, the wires to your home. But again, unless you want to cut that wire, that wire is providing a service. And the question is, what should you pay for it? Well, the, the, from an economic perspective, right, that wire to this house, let's say it had solar, it may have it, I can't see it, but let's say it did. The wire to this house provides the same service whether there's solar on the rooftop or not. Because what that wire does is it provides electricity at two, tomorrow, at two in the morning when you need it. Right? So you got to pay for it. Now, if you say, I'm not using it then, well, disconnect it, right? But nobody's gonna do that. So we have to figure out a way to charge people a reasonable amount and the right amount for the use of the grid when they are generating solar. And the way we do it in Maine now is not the right way. It's okay when a few people do it, but you know, it's okay when a few people roll through a stop sign too, right? But when everybody starts rolling through stop signs, it's, it's a big problem. And as we get more and more people who are doing net metering, we have solar in our house down in Scarborough. As more and more people do net metering, what ends up happening is less and less money goes to the utility, and that means everybody else has to pay for it. And that's not right, <clears throat> especially when the people who are putting solar on their roofs tend to be, not always, but tend to be higher income, better able to afford things. And so what we end up with is net metering as being a far more regressive tax than the lottery. Now, most of you would look at the lottery and say, hey, that's not right. And we shouldn't be taxing poor people to fund education. Well, that's what we're doing with net metering <clears throat> with the electric grid. It's okay now, but it's going to stop 
this year. It's got to stop. I mean, the numbers are getting big. This year, everybody in Maine is going to pay the equivalent of about one cent a kilowatt hour to cover net metering for the people who are doing it. Next year, the number is going to go to a penny and a half. And a year after that, it's probably going to go to two cents. That's just too expensive. And the problem is that it then creates a disincentive to put your heat pump in. It creates a disincentive to change over to an EV. So we've got to move away from net metering. California's been doing it, and they actually have a system that's not too bad. When you use the electricity on your property, you don't pay for it. When you sell it to the grid, what ends up happening is they give you what it's worth when you're generating it. Now, <clears throat> they don't allow you to use the grid as a bank, as a big battery, and take it out when you need it. Now, you get it when you generate it. The problem in California is that when it's being generated, it's dirt. It's not very valuable because everybody's generating electricity. The price in the market is depressed, and so it makes that solar facility look a lot less economically attractive. No free lunches here. I mean, some, we got to you know we got to cut this thing through one way or another. Now I'm going to stop and ans answer any questions that people might have. I know there's tons of them. So could, could you just take a minute to introduce Seth? And oh and sure. Well, I'm going to let Seth introduce himself. But it's going to take a lot longer than a minute. I've listened to his introduction. <laughs> so, truth and advertising. I, I, I am so. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Silkman Rich is the is is such a huge part of the reason that we all get to vote on November seventh on whether to have a pine tree power company that will own and control the grid, which will bring all of this clean energy <clears throat> to us, or stick with what we've got. And, and uh, really, if it wasn't for Dr. Silkman, we would not be here today. Um, many of you volunteered to help to get the signatures to put this on the ballot. Many of you um, have donated to help us to get this on the ballot. And there is a massive uh, multi-billion dollar uh, set of interests that is arrayed against us. But Maine has stood up to um, you know, foreign investor interests before, to foreign monopolies before. From the Battle of Machias uh, to the uh, to the capture of the HMS Boxer to Little Round Top, right, and the abolition of slavery, we have an opportunity to to actually forge our own destiny here when it comes to energy, and to take advantage of the low cost capital that Dr. Silkman has helped us to understand. I'll be handing out uh, to all of you a short letter, uh, two sided, which um, Dr. Silkman and two other um, Ivy League PhDs have signed. They're from Maine. They're all PhD economists, uh, two from Yale, one from Harvard. Uh, it's fun to get them in a room together. They also have different perspectives on, on politics. One is a Republican, one is a Democrat, one is unenrolled. These three economists, no one paid them for their opinion. They are telling you in this letter that we will save $9 billion, that's billion with a B, on net. Uh, look at the costs, look at the benefits, weigh them. $9 billion on net if we vote yes on November 7th. You will be inundated with ads that say it's costly. Remember that. Nine billion in savings, not cost. You'll be inundated with, with uh, ads that say that this is about, um, you know, government taking over. Remember that these utilities, CMP and Versant, are actually owned by foreign governments. That some of their biggest investors, all of the whole investor in the case of one of them, are oil-rich sovereign wealth funds owned by foreign governments in other countries. So we can talk to our conservative neighbors about this. There's lots of reasons to vote yes on, uh, on question three on November 7th. And you don't even have to care about climate, to be honest, to, to care about cost, about reliability, about uh, local control. And these are things that um, we are hopeful we can use to overcome the massive array of ads uh, and PR and lobbyists that are, that are up against us. Um, I'll be much. handing out this, this, and also uh, some some postcards, and that's all for me. I'm, I'm Seth Barry, by the way. Yeah. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Let me just 
just jump in. Yeah. Uh, you know, tomato, tomato, right? I mean, in the end, it's the, the important thing is that there are no investors, private investors in it. There are some advantages to having a quasi-government agency running something Did this large. Change that wording? Because yeah. It's, um, it's not that wording anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the... the <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's cooperatives un, un, under some organizational structures create a financial and legal obligation for the members to se secure the debt of the entity. And once you tell people that you're, you know, writ large, <clears throat> that the consequences of this is that your house is standing behind the seven billion, six billion dollars necessary to acquire this, it loses its attractiveness fast. Cooperatives work really well in small settings where people know each other and are controlling the entity. Except for in Nebraska, it's always been cooperative. Well, they're, they're, they're in, but in Nebraska, that's true. In, in Nebraska, they're large geographic settings, right? but there's only eight people for cooperating. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it, it, it is a little different, but I, but I think that the, the part of that, that's part of the reason. Um, and, and in the end, remember that you got, we have to, if we do this and we're successful, we have to sell these bonds. Somebody's gonna buy them and they're not gonna buy them if <clears throat> there's nothing standing behind them. Now, in the first instance, all the property stands behind it. But, you know, property can go bad, like anything in a house, and you have to create down payments and so on. And so the structure provides a better structure. <coughs> Seth, you can jump in. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, quasi-governmental is a word that CMP is trying to use. That's a, that's a term they're trying to impose on us. And uh, the, the law court decided that, should not, that term should not be used on the ballot. So you will not see it on the ballot precisely because CMP tried to get it on there and um, argued in court that it should be an, a pro bono lawyer working for us managed to get the law court, the sub state supreme judicial court, to strike that from the ballot. You know, we can get caught up in terminology, but really, um, in main law, we talk about consumer-owned or investor-owned utilities. Those are the terms used in Title 35A. Investor-owned is what it sounds like. It's, it's a for-profit enterprise. Consumer-owned utilities include cooperatives. They include munis, as they're referred to. This is really a large muni or muni hybrid, if you want to get technical. But the point is, they're non-profits. They are the opposite of a for-profit. They are non-profits. And that's really the distinguishing characteristic. So I prefer to use non-profit or consumer-owned and just stay out of those other weeds. Sure, Joe. Um, what percentage of um, electricity is produced by people who have solar panels and also businesses who have their own solar panels. And also, how much sense does it make to really incentivize people to put solar panels and businesses uh, install their own solar panels? <clears throat> right now, the total, I and mean, then this is ballpark, the total amount of electricity generated by people who have solar panels on their roof not this other arrangement, like not the community solar, where it's you know, like on a big field and you own a piece of it. But just on their roofs, it's probably less than one-tenth of one percent of all energy generated in Maine today. Uh, you mean all energy or all electricity? All electricity, thank you. All electricity. Yeah, one-tenth of one percent. If you extend that then to include all of the energy in the community solar projects, that people are joining up and participating in or that businesses are participating in, it goes up. At the end of next year, it'll be about 5% of all of the electricity will be generated from those. If you then extend it across to the stuff that is larger than the five megawatts, the bigger projects you know, that you'll see around, some of them haven't been built yet, but they're in the drawing boards to get built. You know, we may approach something like maybe seven or eight percent over the next three or four years but it's still very small as to whether or not it makes financial sense to incentivize i, I think we have to be careful i mean it, it makes sense to incentivize solar to be developed still today and we're doing that with the investment tax credit accelerated depreciation at the federal level we're also doing it in some instances by exempting it from property taxes, you know, in certain locations. So there are some incentives. 
it, it continues to make economic sense <coughs> to do that. And you can, the way to think about that incentive, and it actually turns out not to be that different from, but if you think about that incentive as an alternative form of a carbon we'll take one benefit, here, like okay. the alternative form of a carbon Thank tax, you. like the negative of it, it's roughly, you know, the value is somewhere on the order of 40 or $50 a ton of financial incentive to move to solar. Well, if we had a carbon tax that raised the price of other electricity or other fossil fuels, 40 or $50 a ton, then you wouldn't need the incentive to get people to build solar because they'd be comparing it against something that was that much more expensive. So all of these subsidies are a far less painful way in Washington and in Augusta to introduce carbon taxes. Now, they aren't, they don't have exactly the same effects, but from an individual's perspective, you know, it's, a, it's a, one of these items that offsets a little bit of the, of the environmental harm that otherwise would be created. So it's not that bad. Um, I have a question that kind of digresses to the climate effect. For these offshore winds, how will they be affected, or have you included how they will be affected by the rising uh, level and temperature of the oceans? How will the winds be affected? <coughs> Um, I don't think anybody really knows that yet. Oh, yeah, the question was <clears throat> with offshore wind, and we can deal with onshore wind too. I mean, the climate is changing, <clears throat> wind patterns are changing, solar irradiation levels are changing over time. The question is, how will that affect the ability of those wind generators offshore, or anywhere else for that matter, how will it affect their ability to generate electricity? I, as I say, I don't think anybody knows that with certainty. When you build a wind project, in order to get the bank to finance you or your investors to invest in you, you have to show them initially three years, now 10 years worth of wind measurements to demonstrate that you have the wind and over a 10 year period. And every year we go out in the future, they want 11 years, 12 years, 13, right? The problem is we didn't we have to start somewhere on these and three years was enough to get the early ones financed so you have to put up met towers you have to monitor wind conditions you have to run it through modeling have fairly sophisticated wind modeling flow models to demonstrate how much you can generate and then the bank will talk to you so as i say nobody really knows ultimately you know in the next century what wind patterns will change but these investments are to get us to the next century so Given what we have, the you know, wind and solar irradiation are not day to day, hour to hour, but seasonally are remarkably stable. When you look at the numbers, you know, over the course of a year, they look very, very similar. You know, you'll have high years of like water, hydro. High years, low years, you know, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not so good. But on balance, they do pretty well. Um, you said. Uh, to get where we want to go, we're going to need three and a half times the power we're generating now. Can we reduce that number by shaving the peaks you described, say by putting a timer on our hot water heaters, plugging our electric cars in between 10 and 5? Is there any <coughs> significant number reduction of that three and a half times by doing those sort of things? Um, yes, and, and, that's a, and that's an important point. I mean, we, we will continue to be more efficient in how we use energy. What I didn't mention is that the three and a half times over the next 30 years includes no load growth. So in my model, what I did was I said, we're going to have efficiencies. And what I'm going to assume, and I have no scientific basis for doing this, it's a hypothesis on my part. I'm going to assume that <clears throat> the amount of efficiency that we get every year is offset by the amount of new load that we bring on the system. That is new people, new businesses, expansions, those kinds of things. So I've built it into the modeling at 3.5%. Now, the one thing I can guarantee you is, is that by 2050, those numbers won't be exactly right, right? I mean, if they're going to be wrong, and it's going to be a little bit more, a little bit less. Um, but we should never underestimate how much, what our appetite is for the use of energy, right? I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> to, to, from, from my way of thinking, 
doors shouldn't have to be pushed open. They should automatically open, right? The temperature in my house, well, this is my wife's way of thinking. The temperature in, my, in, in, in our house should match her body requirements, minute by minute, right? And so it goes up and down, right? The thermostat moves. Right? And, and all of that requires energy. Right? We will use as much energy as the good Lord gives us to use. And we can afford because it's because it's a great, great source of civilization. I mean, that's ultimately what civilization is, is the use of increasing amounts of energy. And, and you know that. I mean, there's a physics law that says that entropy, right? I mean, the world will, <clears throat> will reduce to chaos. But what keeps us in order? Energy. And then it's the same thing is true for people. So I, I think we ought to plan all that. Just to give you a quick number. Right now, the computer industry worldwide, this isn't to make computers. I mean, this is the data centers and the processing of data. It uses as much electricity as the country of Great Britain. Now, it's mostly for battery storage. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's all, it's all right. we want to store those pictures of our grandchildren, right? It takes energy. And we've got 85 pictures of them on the slide. We only need one, but 85 are going to get stored, right? Because it's, it's just not worth going through and sifting it. We just use energy. And so that happens. And so that's just today, right? Every data center that's built uses, you know, as much energy as five high schools in Maine. You know, it's just an enormous appetite and will continue to grow. The question was, how do you make the numbers, the investment requirements that we're going to have to do. How do you make them, first, <clears throat> understandable by average people, but secondly, how do you deal with the affordability question? And I think in the, the issue is, which is raised that today we're doing it day to day, we're spending money on energy. Well, and the answer is, is to try to mirror that same approach. And, and how do we do that is we get Pine Tree Power or this main generation authority to issue bonds on our behalf. Right? That raises the money, but we don't pay them off in the first day. Right? That would be silly. We pay them off over time. And so right now we're paying $6 billion for fossil fuels. In this 20, post-2050 world, we'll pay $6 billion, but it'll be going to interest and principal on the debt that's been incurred. And so what we have to do is make sure that the rate structures, what we're paying for electricity, cover us. Now, it's not going to be easy. I don't mean to minimize it. In fact, what will happen, and people don't think across broad spectrums of cost categories. I mean, if I told the average person that I said, look, your electricity bill over the next 30 years is going to, go, is going to increase by a factor of four. I can't afford it. If I then told them, you, well, don't worry about it, though, because you, your oil bill is going to go to zero and they're going to put a gas in the car. They're going to say, what, what are they going to hear? Factor of four, and maybe I won't have to buy oil. Right? It just doesn't, I mean, it's... Well, but, but of course you can. See, but the, even the foreign oil company is going to be doing that to us anyway. You know, <clears throat> again, we, we can't, you know, we, we can't let... It doesn't to sound right, but I'm just saying that we can't let the, the problems that arise stop us from the path to the solution. I understand. Poor people can't buy new, new Teslas. They're never going to buy new Teslas. But you know what? They can't buy new Camrys either. Right? You know, they can't buy new Cadillacs. They can't buy new cars. So what do they have to do is they'll have to buy used cars, like they've always done and always will do. But we're in, but today those used cars are all internal combustion engines. In 30 years, those used cars are all going to be EVs, and they're going to afford EVs. Now they may be the last people to make this transition, but that's just the, somebody's got to be last. And we can't do it all at once immediately. It's too expensive. And it's like anything else that we do in the society. No matter what it is we do, it will move out into the society as people can afford to adopt things. And, and yeah, nope, you know, we're having trouble getting low-income solar on low-income housing. There are other reasons but besides income, but we're having trouble getting it done. But by 2050, they'll have solar on their houses. It just won't happen immediately. But in the meantime, they'll pay oil, 
you know, they won't have to contribute to the electricity costs associated with the, with the bonds. And as they transition, it'll move over and to start including them. Okay, Rich, I can hear a lot of stomach scrumbling. All right, yeah, no, <laughs> gotta, I just want to pitch in three bits of positive good news. One uh, is that under the Inflation Reduction Act, for the first time, mm -hmm. there is actually a subsidy for everybody who buys a used electric vehicle, right. not just a, a new one. Mm -hmm. Second is that a, a month ago, the Maine State Legislature passed the first uh, procurement for offshore wind. It's going to take a few years to implement, but you didn't have to mention that. I wanted to make sure that we put that out there. It reflects the importance of public policy uh, and staying right out there and on uh, public policy. Um, and um, the third one is that we should all be thankful to this gentleman and as well as to uh, Mr. Barry, who's come to help us understand uh, this. and. Halsey, could you step forward one second? A person who is a, C a, a CCL member, put your hand up and wave. Halsey Snow is uh, leading the Fix the Grid uh, uh, program. It's all about permit reform and easing up on uh, the way things uh, happen. So uh, keep focusing on the big picture of policy, I think is one of the messages, because it has a lot of power and it can move uh, a lot of the economy. Thank you. Very, well, very thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> you probably realize that lunch can be obtained uh, under the tree. And then